For those of you just joining us, welcome to the CEC webinar, CEC Standards Development, setting the stage, setting the foundation for the future of special education. I'm pleased to introduce today's presenters, Dr. Steve Berlinghoff and Ginny McLaughlin. Thank you, Megan. Dee and I are delighted to add our words of welcome to all of you on behalf of our Standards Development Work Group. We've had the privilege of collaborating with this truly talented and committed team who have been involved in the standards development efforts since 2017. But as the slide indicates, the standards development and revision processes didn't begin with our current work group. It's been built systematically and strategically based on the work of each of the groups shown on the slide since 2013. Not only has this demonstrated a very intentional ongoing effort, but the series of work groups has ensured the contributions of a large number of individuals bringing their diverse perspectives. The framing paper that immediately preceded our efforts was a directive of the CEC board to actually map the future of CEC professional standards development. And we have been building upon their recommendations in our current work. As the slide indicates, we have parallel standards development efforts in progress for DEC, Division of Early Childhood, and CASE, the Council for Administrators of Special Education. It's been helpful to have these parallel efforts for it enables us to take advantage of some of the synergies in preparing our proposals. It's been helpful that we can share resources and we can share lessons learned. We can move to our timeline. Our timeline. It won't go. <laughs> We have one. We have one. All right, let me try again. There we go. Thank you, Dee. So the um, timeline picks up with our work in um, this past April. Um, as we've shared our draft standards with the Professional Standards Board, with the Professional Standards and Preparation Committee, the CEC Board, and other groups to receive their feedback. Uh, we will actually submit a formative draft of our, of our package to CAPE for review and feedback this July. In the fall, after soliciting feedback from CAPE and from our various response groups, our work group will begin to synthesize the feedback and finalize our drafts. And next winter, final drafts will be open for public comment. In spring 2020, uh, we'll put out the final, the final drafts to the response groups for one more round of feedback. And we'll submit our final drafts to the CEC board for their approval in April 2020. Our package, the full application to CAPE, is due in July 2020. Assuming that that, that application is favorably reviewed, programs will have the option of using the new standards in 2021, and the new standards will become mandatory for program review in 2023. Our standards, as we've been working, we have had some guidelines under which we needed to work. We know that our standards should be developed from the foundational recommendations from the framing 2017 framing paper. We do have to get, we do have to reflect current research, research and trends in the field. We will discuss in a few minutes the knowledge base. We will discuss empirical research and we will also talk about how we have used informed theory and just um, principles of practice. Part of what we also need to do is describe what proficient candidates should know and be able to do when they complete their program. We are talking about candidates, not practicing teachers. So we are talking about people who are still in that developmental pipeline and we are using some of the high leverage practices and the DEC recommendations in shaping how we describe what proficient candidates need to be able to do. The standards will not prescribe 
a preparation practice or curriculum. So we will have guidelines, but there will not be prescriptive practices which programs need to follow. We also, because CEC is an international organization, we need to be global. We cannot use specific strategies or practices. So for example, in the actual standards, you will not see references to IEPs or um, you may not see references specifically to FBAs. Because we work with all types of preparation programs, our standards serve a large constituency so we cannot be as specific as might happen in just the United States. And we are focusing on students and the creation of environments that foster student learning. We also have, need to develop standards which adhere to CAPE guidelines. That means we may have a maximum of seven standards and regardless of how many standards we have, we are also held to a maximum of 28 elements. And all of these elements need to be measurable and accessible. So we need, to, we, are, we will be talking about what are the performances our candidates need to be able to do to know that programs have met the standards. We will continue with a limited number of assessments and there may be six to eight assessments. They, these standards must be written around four principles aligned with task, and you will see as we get into talking about the, um, the knowledge bases, we come back and reference in task in our document in our documentation. So we do have to have a way to talk about the learner and learning. We have to have ways to talk about content. We have to have references to instructional practice, and we have to discuss professional responsibility. We also, throughout the standards and components, need to make sure we pay attention to CAPE's cross-cutting themes of technology and digital learning. So Dee's been talking about a maximum of seven standards and possibly 28 supporting components. We should also be aware that to accompany each of the components, we have to also develop supportive explanations and knowledge bases. And these are currently in development by our standards development work group. So in thinking about this, we have standards with their component supporting explanations and knowledge bases. And to be honest with you, the work group really struggled with trying to get our arms around what each of these sections of our proposal entailed. And I think it helped me to think about that the standards and the components specify what the candidates should know and be able to do, the what. The supporting explanations describe how the components would be demonstrated in practice, the how piece of the puzzle. The knowledge bases explain why the components are important. So when uh, I kind of uh, got my arms around those conceptions, it really helped as we began to draft these pieces of the application. So again, supporting explanations elaborate on what the standard actually means, that scope and focus, what the candidates need to know, understand, and demonstrate when they're acting in ways that meet the standard. And the knowledge base explains why it's important by grounding the, comp the standard and components in foundational documents like in-task standards, like uh, CEC policies, our high leverage practices, and the DEC recommended practices. We also include a literature base, but have to keep in mind this is not intended to be a comprehensive review of the literature. It can't be exhaustive. It will be just the critical pieces that support the component standards. It's also important to recognize that the standards and the components and the supporting explanations and the knowledge bases don't stand alone, that there are other pieces, other sections of the application that are available for uh, CAPE uh, 
program approval, and also to help those of us in educator preparation programs. So next, we'll be working on performance indicators. Uh, these really are examples of how candidate competency might be assessed in EPPs. We also will be developing examples of rubrics that could be used to evaluate performance. Following adoption of our revised pro, uh, standards, there will be a pre um, preparation of complete support materials. So lots of resources for program developers, revised training programs and materials for CEC program reviewers and auditors, and an update of the Red Book, what every special educator must know, professional ethics and standards. So this will all um, expand on the standards and their supporting materials. D? The initial draft standards. So this is an overview. We worked on, and we are working on only the CEC initial preparation standards. We are not yet working on the advanced standards. So the work group really had to focus on performance-based behaviors for candidates who are completing a special education teacher program. So what are the things we can see what are the things programs will be able to measure? What is it we want our candidates to be able to do at the completion of a program? And, and I need to say again, it will be performance-based. We had to work, and we did work within CEC and CAPE parameters to, to develop concise, yet a complete document. So we have received feedback about why didn't you add this? Why isn't this in there? We really had to be careful about how lengthy the standards became. So we were creating, our group worked really hard to create a concise document, getting at the key elements and perhaps not an exhaustive paper on every single um, piece people might like to see described. Please remember, drafts are just that. We are still in the draft phase. We submitted our draft, as Ginny said, the PSPC and the CEC board saw our drafts and approved what we are considering our initial draft, which will be sub submitted to CAPE as of July 1st. As we continue to receive feedback from interested parties, constituent groups, and of course CAPE, the work group will look at that feedback and make revisions as we see appropriate. And then as the drafts do become more complete, we will provide supporting documents. So the supporting explanations, the supporting the knowledge bases, rubrics, um, exemplars, performance indicators. So those things will be forthcoming. As we said previously, we are working on some drafts of those items, and as they become available, they will be posted on the CEC website. So if you look at a comparison, we have the 2012 initial preparation standards, which is what everyone is working off at the current time. And if you look, there were seven standards. And if you look at the new draft initial standards, we, we still have seven. Um, what, some of the things that are different are each standard starts with a verb. And we are looking at trying to be really cognizant of what are the performances we want our candidates to do at the end of a program. You will also see a change that we put engaging in professional learning and practice within ethical guidelines at the forefront. This doesn't mean that it is the most important standard, but the group, um, after receiving previous feedback and having further discussion on the topic, really believed that this professional learning and practice within ethical guidelines really needed to be 
at the front of the standards so everyone could look at the rest of the standards with that lens. Um, and then we looked at each individual's developmental and learning needs, demonstrating curricular and content knowledge. It's really important the group came back and really discussed how it's important for special education teachers to really understand the content and know the content and understand the curricula that they will be teaching. We will again be looking at assessing and planning for individuals, supporting and learning, supporting learning using effective instruction, supporting emotional if supporting emotional and behavioral growth, social emotional and behavioral growth, and collaborating with families, paraprofessionals, and other professionals. The group really felt that it was critical to specifically name paraprofessionals because par paraprofessionals, some and working with that specific group does some, sometimes get lost. So um, they felt that it was important to name that specifically in the standard. So for the next segment of this webinar, we're going to walk quickly through the seven standards and their components, highlighting some of the key components. Please know that you've got the full document available to you, and we realize that in this quick review, um, this quick review is not going to be enough to let you really uh, critique them in a meaningful way. But standard one, as Dee was explaining, involves engaging in professional learning and practice within ethical guidelines. It involves reflection, advocacy, improved outcomes within the social, cultural, and linguistic uh, environment. So standard one has three subcomponents. First, that candidates practice within ethical guidelines, legal policies, and procedures. Again, note that this can't be focused exclusively on the United States. So while we might cite as examples things like IDEA and ESSA, um, they are really examples because uh, with these standards impacting practices internationally, obviously the relevant legislation and policies will vary by the countries involved. Our second component is that candidates advocate for improved outcomes. And finally, candidates design and implement professional learning activities based on their analysis of student learning, their self-reflection, professional standards, research, and contemporary practices. So again, we saw these as kind of providing the front piece for the other standards that follow. So we move on to standard two. Uh, here, this standard focuses on understanding and addressing each individual's developmental and learning needs understanding human growth and development, the multiple influences, individual differences, diversity, including exceptionalities, and families and communities, so that we can plan inclusive learning environments, high quality learning experiences, reflective of each individual's strengths and needs. And again, we have three components under this standard. First, the candidates use their knowledge and understanding of individual growth, development, and learning. Secondly, that candidates apply knowledge and understanding of the multiple influences that affect individual development and learning. And finally, that candidates use their knowledge and understanding of diversity, families, communities, and individual differences, including exceptionalities, to plan and implement learning experiences and environments. Again, although we use terms like knowledge and understanding, we try to connect that with applications so that candidates have a chance to demonstrate that underlying knowledge and understanding. Which brings us to standard three, demonstrating subject matter content and special, specialized curricular knowledge. We are really looking to see that candidates can apply their understanding of academic subject matter to the content of a special educate of the general education curriculum and or specialized curricular curricula in order that they can inform the programmatic and instructional decisions for learners with exceptional exceptionalities. We have two components in standard three. One is applying 
understanding of subject matter content. It's really important that if students are teaching a lesson in math, that they do understand the math content going with that lesson. Likewise, in, in, con in component two, if students are working with, if our candidates are working with children with some sort of specialized curriculum, they need to apply their understanding of specialized curricula in making programmatic decisions. We, um, the group worked diligently to work cross categorically as best as we could in this standard, knowing that we have some mild moderate preparation programs, and then we have some more specialized programs, and we wanted to, this standard to be able to address across those needs in um, assessing how programs are, are operating. When, you, when we look at standard four using assessment to understand the learner and the learning environment for data-based decision-making, you'll see that this is, this is a big one. Um, assessment is, is large in the field, and we felt like we had to have lots of components and ways to really support this standard. So we're looking at assessing candidates assessing students' learning behavior and the classroom environment in order to evaluate and support classroom and school-based problem-solving systems of intervention and instruction. We are looking for candidates to evaluate students' strengths and needs and contribute to eligibility determination, communicate progress, look at short-term and long-term instructional planning, and making ongoing adjustments to instruction using technology as appropriate. In element one or component one, we are looking for candidates to collaboratively develop, assess, and administer multiple measures of student learning behavior and classroom environment. And we're looking to support classroom and school-based systems of intervention for students with and without exceptionalities. We are also in component two, looking for our candidates to develop, select, and administer multiple formal and informal measures of assessment, which are culturally and linguistically appropriate, using measures and procedures that are valid and reliable so they are able to contribute to eligibility determination for special education services. In component three, again, we are looking for candidates to assess, collaboratively analyze, interpret, and communicate students' progress in measurable outcomes using technology to inform progress on both short-term and long-term long planning, and then of course making ongoing adjustments to instruction. As we move on to standard five, supporting learning using effective instruction, uh, we'll actually be working with the next two slides because not surprisingly, this uh, focus on instruction takes a little more components to unpack. So whereas the others have had two or three standard five uh, actually has six components. So here we're talking about applying the knowledge of individuals' development, learning needs, and assessment, things that other standards have addressed, to inform decisions about effective instruction. As we move to the first component, candidates actually use the findings from multiple assessments, and we've identified student self-assessment, uh, measures that are responsive to cultural and linguistic diversity, and other assessments to identify what students know and are able to do. It's the importance of interpreting the assessment data to appropriately plan and guide instruction that's really critical for candidates' performance. The second component talks about using effective strategies to promote active student engagement. 
increasing student motivation and enhancing self-regulation of student learning. The third component focuses on explicit systematic instruction for teaching content strategies and skills, making it clear what a learner needs to do and also think about when learning both academic and social behavioral content. As we move on to the remaining three components, the fourth deals with flexible grouping to support instruction that's adapted to meet the needs of each individual and group. The fifth component involves candidates organizing and managing focused, intensive, small group instruction. Beyond the flexible grouping in typically larger and heterogeneous classes, here we're really getting at the intensive small group instruction to meet individual learning needs. And finally, candidates plan and deliver specialized individualized instruction to meet the learning needs of each individual. So again, standard five is um, kind of the crux of our role as special educators, and we therefore uh, have more components relative to this particular standard. So when we look at standard six, supporting social, emotional, and behavioral growth, we are, this is where you will see some overlap because we do a talk about using multiple measures and we talk about using data, but we are really looking for candidates to create and contribute to safe, respectful, and productive learning environments for individuals with exceptionalities. And this is where we really get into the use of effective routines and procedures and preventive and responsive practices. So when, when we look at component one, we're talking about really about shaping and measuring whether our candidates can use effective routines and procedures when they create safe, caring, respectful, and productive learning environments. We want them to understand that routines and procedures make make better learning and um, just environments for their students. We look at component component two, we are looking for our candidates to use a range of preventive and responsive practices. So we, and we want them to use effective practices in, in their students' social, emotional, and educational well-being, because we want our candidates to see that what happens socially and emotionally can affect what happens academically. And much like was referenced in standard four and standard five, we are looking for candidates to systematically use data from a variety of sources. In this case, we are looking for our candidates to understand or identify the purpose or function served by a behavior, and then looking at that information to plan, implement, and evaluate behavioral interventions and social skills programs. And we want our candidates to be able to address generalization to other environments. When we look at standard seven, we are talking about collaborating with families paraprofessionals and other professionals. We, in this standard, our, the work group was looking at getting our candidates to work in teams, to apply processes and really effective communication strategies to collaborate in cult culturally responsive manners with families, paraprofessionals and other professionals. Um, we, this is where we had lots of discussion about whether paraprofessionals would be lumped within other professionals. And the group felt strongly that paraprofessionals needed to stand out as its own group so that as teacher educators, um, we could really put a lens on getting our candidates to understand the importance of working with all constituents. Within a school, other educational settings, because we do know that some of our candidates are work, work um, on teams outside of a traditional educational setting. 
And we know that some of our candidates are working on teams to work in the community to make plans for access to services. We wanted in component one, our candidates to utilize communication, group facilitation, and problem solving strategies in a culturally responsive manner to lead effective meetings. So we're looking here at how well do our candidates use what they know about good interpersonal skills and how do they respond in a culturally responsive manner to be good team leaders. When we look at component two, we are looking at how do our candidates collaborate, communicate, and coordinate with families, paraprofessionals, and other, para other professionals within the educational setting. So we're looking at how are candidates working well within an educational setting. And then if you'll notice, component three is looking at how do our candidates collaborate, communicate, and coordinate services with professionals and agencies within the community. So we, we discussed how we needed to have separate components so that candidates would learn and be able to work with professionals, paraprofessionals, and community service providers in community settings. So as we move through these seven standards and their supporting explanations, hopefully you've gotten a sense that the standard itself is the overarching description of uh, the practices that we expect candidates to demonstrate. It's then unpacked in a series of component statements that really take the critical practices and explain them in more detail. Nothing should really be introduced at the component level that wasn't referenced in the standard itself. So as you go through and give us your feedback, um, that's something to, to tune into. And we know that this is a lot of information to process uh, during the course of a fairly brief webinar. So again, encourage you to use this as an introduction as you go into the actual documents to begin your review. Now we're gonna give you a preview of what the supporting explanations and the knowledge bases are going to look like. We've said several times that the standards development work group is still drafting and editing these sections. They weren't quite ready for prime time or to unveil as a full set. But we've chosen to highlight component 5.3, which focuses on explicit instruction. This is such a critical aspect of our special education role that it seemed a good one to use as an example. Again, the component specifies what the candidate should know and be able to do. And this supporting explanation explains how the component could be demonstrated in practice, what candidates should be doing to demonstrate mastery. I thought if we read just a few sentences of this, you'd get a flavor, get a feel for uh, what the supporting explanation attempts to do. So typically um, we take each of the key constructs within the component and explain and give examples as appropriate. So candidates use explicit systematic instruction to focus on important academic content and make clear what the st students need to do or think about when learning that content. They make content explicit by providing a clear statement regarding the purpose for learning the content, strategy, or skill, and making explicit connections to existing knowledge and skills. Candidates also provide a clear explanation of the content strategy or skill to be learned, focus instruction on the steps that lead to learning, and use scaffolds and feedback to guide the learner. So you can see in just those few sentences that it really goes into considerably more detail or descriptive uh, information about what this would look like in practice. Uh, the supporting explanation actually covers two slides. So I'll give you a chance to, to read them. You'll see in parenthetical uh, places that um, they're examples. 
For example, this closes with immediate discussion or written notes. Uh, again, these are not meant to be prescriptive, but they're meant to just be illustrative of what this might look like in practice. So uh, this is just an example of a supporting explanation. Remember, this focuses on the how, and uh, we'll now share with you the knowledge base that explains why um, this is important. So as Ginny just said, the, um, the supporting explanation is the how. This, this knowledge base is really the why. Why, what evidence do we have that these are important um, and why, how can we document that we should be using these standards and components and then what supports the knowledge base? So we, um, we looked at when we wrote the knowledge bases um, and as Ginny said previously, it, it, was, it was hard to get our heads wrapped around the supporting explanations and the knowledge bases and really, really get them to be clear and understandable. So we looked at really the first sort of the first paragraph in, in a knowledge base description sort of being an overview. And we started to think about it as a funnel of knowledge where we would start with the big thing. And the big thing is the in-task standards. Because if you remember from earlier, one of the requirements of our standards development is that we have to be in line with in-task standards. So we, we are starting our knowledge bases with the in-task standards and how each standard and component will align with the relevant in-task standards. We might also have some references to CEC policy or CEC statements that, that have been made and we've referenced those. There you will find references to the Division for Early Childhood Recommended Practices. And now this is when we're starting to get a little more detailed because we're starting to get a little more specific in the knowledge base. You might find some content specific uh, references like in math or English language arts. When we got a little more specific, we started making references to the high leverage practices. So um, you will find as it says, we start to funnel down, things get more and more specific. And then on the next page, um, you'll see some more specific references. We also felt like it was appropriate to reference some of the principles of practice or areas where we knew there was guidance on some of the practices we were referencing. So you might find national centers included in the knowledge base. There might be references to CEDAR. There might be references to the IRIS Center. There might be references to PBIS.org um, because we felt like some of the, those places, um, What Works Clearinghouse, have done a lot of background work on the effective practices that we're referencing. So just, and I won't read everything um, because you can take a look at that yourself, but explicit systematic instruction is emphasized in in-task standards two, four, six, and eight, as well as the elementary standards in standard four, key element 4C. And rather than reiterating the standards, we're kind of giving an overview. So these standards highlight building on learners' prior knowledge and skills, addressing misconceptions that interfere with learning, and providing multiple models and representations of concepts and skills for learners. Furthermore, explicit systematic instruction is emphasized in CEC 2015 Standard 5 as candidates use explicit instruction. And then it gets into the high leverage practices in 2017 and moves further down to the DEC and the mathematics advisory panel supports using explicit instruction to teach computation and problem solving skills. 
if we look at the next slide, we really start to get into more specific references. And what each of the groups did as they were providing their references and writing the knowledge base was to, the, was to go back to the supporting explanation and go back to the components to make sure that if, if, if a reference was provided in the knowledge base, that content was also referenced in, in the what and the how. So students with disabilities require more systematically designed explicit instruction than typically developing peers. And you'll see a reference for Archer and Hughes 2011. There's a reference to Patty 2009, Fuchs and Fuchs 1986. Um, I will say we tried as best as we could to keep within a 10 year window unless we found something we felt was really critical or seminal work in that component area. And there are effect sizes were largest amongst, among students least likely to understand relationships between lower and higher order constructs. And then there are some references for those. And again, a reference research has revealed that explicit instruction is particularly effective for students who are struggling to learn disciplinary content including those with disabilities. For example, students who are struggling to learn to read, including English language learners and students with disabilities benefit from explicit instruction. And then there are several references. And then there are some references, similarly syntheses of research on teaching mathematics to low achieving students and students with disabilities have, have revealed that the use of explicit instruction significantly improved math achievement of students who are struggling to learn this content. So next steps. We, there will be shortly following, it may not be five minutes following, you will receive an online survey for every for everyone who has participated in the webinar. Um, you will receive uh, an invitation to participate in a survey on these online on these drafts. There were also there is also a um, an invitation to the survey on the CEC website. You will have additional in person feedback opportunities like we did at TED 2018. At TED 2019 in New Orleans, we will have two feedback sessions and um, we welcome you to come to those sessions and give us input. We always have note takers and then we take that feedback, basically word for word, back to the work group and we talk about the feedback and we discuss where and if we can incorporate that into the standards and, and how we can make that feedback useful. At TED, there will be two sessions. One will most likely be a morning session, and then there will be an afternoon session on a different day. You will also have the opportunity, of course, while we hope you attend TED in New Orleans, um, there will be an, an additional opportunity for feedback at the CEC annual convention in Portland, Oregon, and that is February 5th to 8th. We don't have the time for that yet or the day, but we will have a feedback session. And just like we do at TED, we have note takers, and then we take that feedback back to the group, and the, and the group does have a chance to see everything that is said, and we openly do discuss. So several oh. times, yeah, we've mentioned the standards development link on the CEC website, and we keep pushing the feedback survey. Please not only respond to it yourselves, but encourage your colleagues to give us feedback. We really want to cast a wide net, and uh, we're at the perfect stage to take the formative suggestions and incorporate them to the best of our ability. So encourage others to respond as well. On that site, you find the current, the most recent drafts of the standards, the components, the supporting explanations, and shortly we'll have the knowledge bases up there as well. 
this webinar recording it will be archived and people can access it. Uh, you also um, find a list of the members of this work group and their affiliations. So you can see the group of people that I was bragging about. And uh, we'll have specifics about the public feedback opportunities. So uh, we appreciate your participating in this webinar and most importantly, your active interest in CEC standards development. Please continue to follow the process and provide that feedback. We really are counting on you because we want these standards to be perceived as as useful as they can be. Megan? We'll give you all just a few minutes. If you have questions for Dean and Ginny right now, you feel free to type those in the chat box. Um, as we mentioned on this slide, the uh, opportunity to review the draft standards, components, and support explanations, as well as provide feedback on them or rewatch the recording of this webinar will be available on that cec.sped.org slash standards development site. And don't worry about writing that link in an email afterwards as well. Um, we've gotten a couple great feedback questions, positive feedback, which I know us special educators love to give um, about keeping the focus on the individual student and focusing on working with paraprofessionals, since those are really two really important pieces of the special educator's job. That's good to hear. And it doesn't look like positive. It doesn't look like any other questions are coming in right this moment. We'll give you guys just another second or so. And I will say, Vinny and I, both, and Megan and Jen and Margie Crutchfield, have received questions from time to time after the webinar, after TED. And um, we have taken those questions or feedback, and we have presented those comments and feedback to the work group, even if it came outside the webinar, because we are trying to take as much feedback as input at, and input as we can as we facilitate this process. Okay, we've got two great questions that came in and just prefacing these guys with, we may not be able to answer these right away, especially if you're giving suggestions for things to include in them, but just know that we do have these noted down. We'll be incorporating everybody's comments in future revisions as we move towards finalizing these drafts. So Kate's wondering, how do you think the HLPs fit in? I know this is one we can answer because we've had a lot of discussion about this. Now we've looked closely at the HLPs and attempted to embed them in the definition of our standards and components because the framing paper that we referenced earlier really emphasized that this version of CEC standards were to be practice based and were to build upon the HLP work that's been done. So um, if people are addressing the standards uh, very carefully, um, that should incorporate the HLPs as well. D, is that? It does, would... and I think when you can see more of the supporting explanations and especially the knowledge bases, because all of us are linking the, um, the knowledge base to the HLPs, you'll be able to see the direct connection. I know when I was writing, I sat with the two HLP books kind of on my workspace, really trying to make sure I could document that the standards and the HLPs were related. And here's a question in regards to the knowledge bases. I know we only looked at one of them as an example. Um, they do include global references as well. I know we talked about using a lot of national centers and things like that. And I know we only looked at 5.3, I think it was, out of our, what, 26 elements or something like that. But these um, knowledge base components, at least the drafts we've seen, do include global references, correct? We are trying to. Um, in some cases, there are international references, like from uh, the UN um, or um, other international coalitions. Uh, and to the extent that we are able to locate uh, parallel legislation and policies, at least as examples, we would like to do that. So that's an area where we'd welcome feedback from members who um, practice in other countries because you could make us aware of certain policies or um, laws in your countries that we ought to include. 
And I, I think it's important to say that the work group is really cognizant of the need to reference global policies. Um, that they have mentioned that in discussing their work. Um, but I, I agree with Ginny. If you have any references, we're happy to take them and pass them along. On a similar note, we just got a question about uh, seeking feedback and input on um, the international side of things. And this is just a reminder, CEC standards are not limited just to CEC members. They are for the entire field of special education. So if you have someone who would like to provide input from an international perspective, from any perspective, they are welcome to go to that standards development page on the CEC website and provide their feedback using that survey. And we do ask questions about um, what country or state if your if you're US folks are uh, representing. So we do um, incorporate an inter international folks into our feedback as well. All right, um, the last question that I don't know if we'll be able to answer this one without <laughs> all of you guys getting to see the entire draft of everything that's still be in progress, but we're maintaining focus on the individuals rather than the curriculum, correct? I think, yes. I think, Ginny, you explained that one well earlier, if I'm right. Would would either of you like to jump in and take that one? I, th I think the, the um, person is asking um, whether we're evaluating programs or candidate performance. And the focus is definitely on what candidates are expected to know and be able to do. And so the program appraisal is based on how well the program can document that candidates have indeed mastered these important standards and components. So right. if, if, that, if that's the question about the individual versus the program, uh, it's more the outcomes, what candidates um, can demonstrate in terms of effective practices. And, and we haven't um, we haven't gotten there yet because we've been working on a supporting explanation and knowledge bases, but we will also be developing um, essentially performance indicators. So those performance indicators will give examples of what it might what candidates performance might look like. What I, kinds of I can't evidence. think of one. I cannot think of one off the top of my head. Yeah, what kinds of evidence um, education preparation programs might present uh, as um, uh, indicating that candidates have mastered this and thus the program is performing effectively? It looks like that's the end of our questions for now. I know you guys are probably raring to get at the full draft of the standards components and supporting explanations. So with that, I'll go ahead and conclude today's webinar.